I'm going to continue with strings, obviously. Um, anybody have any questions about anything? I'm grading. I spend a lot of time grading. <laughs> right? We, this is class is big, and then there are like 25 other students. Okay. Um, distance learning students. Uh, okay. All right. So we talked about um, infinite strings. And you notice we didn't say anything about what's, I don't think I said anything about what's causing the wave. Well, let, we need to obviously get into that. So now we're going to do what's called a semi infinite string. So it's terminated here, and then it's infinite that way. And we're going to have a force drive here. Uh, oh, when people say force drive, that means that the force is specified. The force amplitude is, is specified. There are other types of drives. You could have a, a displacement amplitude. There the displacement would be specified. Uh, so this is our typical case, as you know, from oscillators. And we're going to make do this as simply as possible here. We just want to focus on the fact that we're now, we've now got a force in here. So we'll take the termination here to be as simple as possible. It's a massless, frictionless ring, OK? And oh, now that I think about it, we will be able to easily generalize this to put some stiffness in here, uh, some inertia, some damping. Through impedance, we'll be able to easily do it. And that, that's one of the advantages of impedance, is to, when you get to more complicated situations, you can just add it on. It's very easy to do, as you will see. You'll see this in this, co in this course, in, in this chapter. Okay, well, of course, we've got, we don't even think about it anymore, do we? The actual force is actually the real part of this, which will be F times the cosine of omega t. Um, and we'll do everything, we're going to do everything it's very convenient to use complex numbers, and then we'll take the real part at the end. Or maybe we won't. <laughs> I can see that I didn't do that here, but it's understood, right? Uh, okay, now, an important point, we already started to talk about this, but I'm going over it. There is an assumption here that there are no waves coming in from infinity this way, which is very reasonable but it really should be stated here. So we only have right traveling waves. That means in our general solution here, we can kill this. This is a left traveling wave, so we kill it. We just have to deal with that. So we know that the solution here is not a, um, there's a reduction from some arbitrary disturbance as a function of two variables, space and time. It only can be a function of this combination of space and time. This single is really just a single variable here. It's a big simplification. Okay, we're going to look in the steady state, as I mentioned yesterday. And in the steady state, every mass element here has to be moving in simple harmonic motion at the same frequency as the drive. It's got to be. Okay? And that's true, of course, for the termination here, too, for the ring, which is also, which is you can think of it as part of the string here. For the string at x equals zero, it's going to have to be moving at simple harmonic, at the same frequency of the drive, in the steady state. So we're going to set <coughs> the amplitude here at x equals zero, the, the displacement at x equals zero, to be some complex amplitude times e to the i omega t. And again, as I mentioned yesterday, we, it's really important that we keep this complex right now. Well, you'll see why, but explicitly. But we don't know the phase of the response here relative to the drive. So that if, it, if there is a phase, it'll be in the, arg in the phase angle here of this complex number. Very convenient. Okay, so our function of x and t can only be a function of ct minus x, because it's a right traveling wave. And we know at, at x equals zero, that means we get y of ct, we just let's set x equal to zero, and we're setting it equal to this. It's got to be go to like e to the i omega t with some complex amplitude. At this point, it's convenient to introduce a quantity called the wave number. This is used extensively when people deal with any kinds of waves. And I mentioned it actually some weeks ago. This is why we use S, this is why KFCS use little s for the spring constant, because we use this so much, or K, this wave number here. And it's defined as omega divided by C. And when we do that, you can see that omega is 
CK or KC. So we can write our solution here like this. And now you'll notice here um, this is really just a dummy variable as, as we've seen before. We can replace this with some symbol. We almost always use C here. All right, and the reason I, that's an intermediate step, because once you recognize this, this is the, uh, the essential math here, is that y is a function of, of a, ver a single variable is a constant complex amplitude times e to the i k times that variable. There's nothing that stops us from replacing c now with c t minus x. <coughs> so we do that. This is supposed to be, this is an old, this is supposed to be a, just the complex a, of course. Where it is, there it is, right there. Okay, and now we end up with something, we end up with this, many of you have probably seen this before, no matter what kind of waves you deal with, this is, this is, this is often used, it's very common, okay. Now there's something that distinguishes our waves, we're dealing with the wave equation, we actually, um, uh, this is more general than that. And I'll make a comment on that in a moment. But this is what we derived at this point. This is a very standard form, and it's used universally for all kinds of waves. And of course, we mean the real part, right? Uh, next is to, oh yeah, here we go. So A, we can always write A as some amplitude or modulus times e to the i phase angle, where you know, A and phi are constant. And so here's the actual wave, the actual wave that we've got. And by the way, we're, we're taking diversions here to develop the, the general theory. The goal here is to determine A and phi for our drive. That's our goal. I just want to point that out. It's just going to take us a little while because we've got all these other preliminaries to get through here. Um, so I've said this, in the steady state, everything's going to have to go at the same frequency, and you can see that here. It's, it's in the math. If you take a snapshot, remember that means at a definite time, any time, the wave will look something like this. It's a sinusoid traveling to the right, right? And there is, of course, I think everybody probably knows this, the wavelength is the distance it takes for the wave to repeat, right? So crest to crest, or trough to trough, or zero crossing to zero crossing, but you got to skip this one because the wave hasn't repeated, right? So it's all going to be the same value here. That's defined to be the wavelength, and everyone uses la lowercase lambda for that. So what's the wavelength? What's mathematically, what's the wavelength here? So we imagine freezing time, like we did here in this snapshot. You can set it equal to zero if you like. It doesn't, it's not going to matter. And let's say I start at x equals zero. I'm going to have some phase. There's going to be some value here for this frozen time. How far do I have to go in x? How much do I have to increase x from zero to get back to the same argument here? So that would be two pi radians, 360 degrees, or two pi radians. So if I start at x equals zero, this is going to be zero. What's the minimum distance I have to go to make this 2 pi? That's going to that's be repeat. These are sinusoids, right? This is sinusoid that repeats. So I've got it. This has to increment by 2 pi. So the wavelength is going to be 2 pi over k. That's going to be the wavelength. And the way everybody writes this is not this way, but this is what you want to remember. <laughs> okay, this is the easiest thing to remember. That k is 2 pi over the wavelength. And you, of course you can go this way. You can come up with this, right? But this is the tip, typical thing that is just burned in everybody's brains. This k is 2 pi over the wavelength. And incidentally, I should point out here that k is useful in different ways. One of them is it's much easier to write this rather than to put the wavelength in there. Because then we would have a 2 and a pi and the wavelength downstairs. A similar thing happens with omega here. So in theory, when people do theory, they typically use omega and k. When you're doing an experiment, you're, you're thinking more of f, the frequency, and the actual wavelength. Okay? Um, all right. So, 
let's follow, this is a waves traveling to the right, let's follow a crest or a trough, doesn't matter, any point on the wave. Let's follow that, okay? By following it, I mean that this, we have to keep, this, this value is a constant. As time is incremented, we're going to see what happens to x to keep this constant. We're following a point on the wave. And to do that, by setting this constant, the next thing to do here is just take the differential of this, because we're incrementing time and space such that we're on a point on the wave. We get this, and this is easily solved for the velocity here. And we know what the, I, I don't like the way I wrote this, we know what the velocity is. We derived that yesterday or the day before. It's c, right? That's the phase speed or the, or the wave velocity here in our case. So we know this has to be c. And what we get from this is that c is equal to omega over k. That's, that's the new information we're getting here. That's got to be the relationship. People think of it as omega is equal to ck. <coughs> right? And this is no mystery. I mean, it's, you, you know, it's, we've gotten it mathematically here, but if you want to know what it physically represents, it's actually very obvious. Go to the experimental variables, go to frequency and wavelength. Okay, so for k, replace it with 2 pi over the wavelength. Replace omega with uh, 2 pi times f. You can cancel the 2 pi's and you get this. This is what people, uh, when people do elementary, you know, introductory physics, introductory waves, no matter whether it's physics or whatever, this is what's used. But after you get off the introductory level, we hardly use this, it's, it's usually this, okay? But you'll use it in, the la in an experiment, you know, use it, because in experiment, the more accessible quantities are the frequency and the wavelength, like I just said. So what is this? Do you know what this is? It's just that the speed is distance over time. Because if I look at this, I look at this wave traveling here, and I look at it over a time where this crest goes to this, where the other, you know, this moves to this point right here. It's moved a distance of one wavelength, and what, how much time is that taken? Well, that's one cycle. If you're sitting here measuring the cycles of the waves, and this goes from here to here, you're going to measure that as one period. The period is one over the frequency, so you just get this. So there's absolutely no mystery here. This is just speed is distance over time, this. And these are equivalent. Now, I need to say something that's not in the notes here. This is so important in, in any, when you deal with waves, it has a name. I don't know if I've said it before. It's called the dispersion relationship. So why do people have a fancy name for something like this? Well, we're doing the wave equation here, right? But a lot of this is common to all waves. This is common to all waves. The issue is, what's the relationship between omega and k? In our case, they scale, they're proportional to each other. They're not proportional to each other for gravity waves, waves on the ocean, okay? So when you get to other systems that are, that are dispersive, like we talked about yesterday. Um, this is still true, but this c here becomes a function of k, or omega, however you want to think of it. It's no longer an absolute constant. So for us, this is just an absolute constant. We have this very simple dispersion relationship. Uh, okay, any questions so far? All right, so remember, back to the point, it was <laughs> All these diversions. What we're, what we're after here is A and phi. Remember? Do we want to? That should be uniquely determined. In a steady state, if I have a, some prescribed, you know, force amplitude and, for, and forcing frequency, in a steady state, there's got to be a unique response here, a unique, unique amplitude, and some phase relative to the drive, and they're on equal footing, right? Amplitude and phase. Okay. So let's get back to our problem here. Um, um, we've got to do a Newton's second law on the ring, on our max, massless frictionless ring. The net force has to be zero. Remember that? Because otherwise we'd have infinite acceleration. So there's 
two, there are two forces on the ring. There's this instantaneous force due to the drive, okay? And then there's, okay, I gotta back up here. Um, parallel to the, to the system here, okay, to the string, this, in this horizontal direction here, okay, well, I guess the best way we say is longitudinal. In the longitudinal direction here, there is a, going to be a component of the tension, this way, in the string, and that's balanced by what? Normal. The normal force of the pole here, or whatever, right? So those have to balance for all time. And that doesn't really tell us, that tells us what the normal force is, we don't really care, okay? What we care about is the transverse motion here. So let's look at it, Newton's second law in, trend, in the transverse direction here. There's this instantaneous force, and that has to be balanced by the transverse component of the tension force here. There's a tension force going off right along that direction of the dotted line there. And you can see that that component is going to be the sine of theta. It's going to be the tension times the sine of theta. So you see the right triangle here. I'm going to resolve this tension force into a horizontal, com a longitudinal component and a transverse component. And that's the trans. This has to be true for all time for our model. So we got to get rid of theta. It naturally emerges, but it's not a good variable for us. Just like uh, yesterday or the day before. I can't remember. Remember, theta is small here, small displacements, small slopes. So the sine of theta is approximately equal to theta, which is approximately equal to the tangent of theta. And why did I go to the tangent of theta? Because that's just the slope. That's dy dx. So, specifically, it's going to be the partial derivative of y with respect to x evaluated at x equals zero. So we can do that in our general in our expression here, we're com complex. Well, I guess we should go here. Okay, we can take the x derivative of that, and then here it is, sorry, here it is right there. I don't know why I went hunting for it, it's right there. We take the x derivative and then we set x equals zero. And all it does is bring down an um, i omega. All right, and then we substitute it into this force balance equation here. That gives us f times e to the i omega t. This is gonna be a t, which I left out here, but it magically appeared later. I need a tension here. And this, you can just do this in your head, the x derivative. Oh, I might have said i omega, I meant, I, I, I meant minus i k, minus i k. The x derivative brings down a minus i k, sorry. There it is. And now we can solve for this amplitude. And again, I want you guys to appreciate this, okay, because um, after a while nobody thinks about it anymore, but to you it's probably kind of a, um, difficult to keep doing all this complex stuff, right? After a while you won't think about it anymore. Maybe some of you are already there. But you can see the utility of it. We've got amplitude and phase information here together. They just go together. It's, it's na so natural here rather than dealing with these two separate unknowns that we need to determine. That's really the whole point of using complex numbers for oscillations and waves. All right, so here we, we get this, look at this. Um, now we can, exp we've come up with a unique solution for the motion, the steady state motion. Here's the displacement. The displacement is just gonna be A times E to the I omega, it's gonna be this. The velocity is the time derivative. That brings down an I omega, the I's cancel and we get omega here. What's omega? You would need to always, and again, this is one of those things after a while you won't think about it. We can simplify this. How do we simplify it? Omega is equal to CK. So it's an a identity that we use, a relationship that we use a lot here in acoustics. So omega is equal to CK, I'm going to be able to um, cancel the case and I just get a C. There's the velocity. 
Uh, we could determine the acceleration, but we don't need to do that. The reason we've determined the velocity here is that this is the appropriate variable to deal with. And the reason is one word, impedance. So we're going to define here, in this case, in this particular case here, the semi-infinite, for this situation, it'll vary for different situations, but for this situation right here, we're going to define the mechanical impedance. It's called the input mechanical impedance because it's the driving, um, it's also called the driving point impedance because it's where it's being driven, or the input, this is where the drive is being input into the system, so that's why people use this word. It's the complex force divided by the complex velocity that we've seen before. Same idea here. Uh, the M is for mechanical, to distinguish it from electrical. The zero signifies input, okay? And this is just a notation that KFCS used. It doesn't have to be X equals zero, but I think almost always we can Choose, you know, we can choose our spatial origin anywhere we want to, right? So when we have a driven system, usually we're going to call that x equals zero. Usually, I don't know if it's always, I'm not so sure it's always true, but that's what the zero signifies here. It's the, it's the driven point, the driving point. And you can see there's the x equals zero. So we look at this ratio, and because we have a linear system here, the force cancels out, and you can do this in your head if you take the force, complex force, divided by the complex velocity right here, you just get rho c. In our case, rho l c. And I want to tell you that this is, this is true, oh, this is true for acoustics, okay? Oh, I never thought about it for dispersive wave systems. Might be true there. Um, well, it's probably true there too, but then C is not a, C depends upon frequency. It's probably true there too. Let's not worry about that. We'll get a huge amount of use out of this. This is going to be true for sound waves too. Like a lot of this stuff is going to be carry over to sound waves. So that's the impedance. Very easy to remember, rho C. Now in acoustics, it's going to be the actual density, the mass per unit volume. Here, the appropriate density is the mass per unit length. <coughs> And again, I want to impress upon you, this is the impedance, which is the complex force divided by the complex velocity, for this case right here, with a sem semi-infant string. If, we t if the string is terminated here, that's, and it's going to involve more work, right? That's going to be, incidentally, the next problem, right? T uh, Tuesday, I guess. Why is it going to be different? Reflections. Reflections, oh yeah. So it's going to be a little bit more complicated. Do you think the impedance is going to change? <laughs> okay, imagine you're, you're, you're doing this, right? And you're sending this wave. It's gone. So it doesn't come back, right? And then somebody terminates the string there. You think you're not going to feel that? Huh? I'm pretty strong, so... I'm sorry, you're pretty... I'm well, pretty strong, so... <laughs> You're not sensitive though. <laughs> if you're sufficiently sensitive, you're gonna feel it, obviously, right? Yeah, it's gonna be, so, important fact here, and you need to get used to this. This is not like the universal impedance, okay? This is impedance when we have no termination here. And it, the same thing will happen for sound, but it only occurs when the waves aren't coming back. And we can say a little bit more about that. You'll notice here, where's the, Imaginary, where's the reactance? <coughs> Remember impedance is, has a real part which we call the resistance and the imaginary part that we call the reactance. The reactance is zero here. Now the reactance is associated with when you're driving something and it responds back on you. In some, you, know, you, you feel it responding back to you. I don't know how to say this. This is, kind of, this is real nebulous. The re... <sighs> Well, let me just state this. The reason this is real and has no reactive part is these waves, once, as they're launched, they're gone. They never come back. So when we terminate this, the fact that we're having waves come back, we're gonna, this is going to become complex. There'll be some reactance. Now, I'm not really proving that to you, but I'm just stating it. And you'll get, just like anything, you'll get used to it after a while. Uh, so this is what I just said. Uh, oh, now you'll notice here that this, 
what is, how does this depend upon the drive? It, it doesn't care. It doesn't care about the drive. It doesn't care about the drive amplitude. It doesn't care about the drive frequency. This is characteristic. This quantity is, 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 represents the medium. So some people call it, um, I often call it the wave impedance. Uh, but you can also call it, the, people call it the characteristic impedance. And, and often you can call it, maybe it's better to call it the trap. You know, this is, this is for a traveling wave in one direction. So when we say wave impedance, we're implying it's one direction. But it's characteristic of the medium. So some people in, in KFCS do this, they'll call it the characteristic impedance. Oh, wow, we're moving. Um, well, I guess that's okay. You sure there aren't any questions? We have plenty of time. <laughs> I don't know how I went so fast. I thought I was going slowly. Okay. Uh, so we're almost done. We're almost done. But I can drag anything out. To the, <laughs> I'm an expert at that. <laughs> I'll start talking about research. You know, it's, it's endless. Okay. So here's a really important point, and um, I actually remember this from high school. I got exposed to this in high school. Uh, you know, Cold War. So, I took the physics I took in high school. I can talk about this now because we have time. Was called PSSC physics, Physical Science Study Committee. That just, I, I can't get that out of my head, and I'm sure I'm not the only one. Okay, and it was developed because of all this interest in education, which was primarily driven by, you know, possibility of nuclear war. Right. So we. Um, I distinctly remember seeing a, a, a film clip, they didn't have video, a, a film clip of the wave machine with a wave being just swallowed up by this dash pot here. Right? As, and we talked a little about this yesterday, we're going to talk more about it right now. Um, it's a re really remarkable fact. Now, I don't, can't remember what explanation they give. I, they, there's no way they could have given what, what you guys have seen, what we've seen here, okay? But it's a really remarkable property. So we, we can now address that. We can now explain how you can get no reflections, all right? So imagine you're, you're, driving, um, you're driving this system here, this wave. You're driving this up and down. You see, that's what people say, you see a certain impedance. Here's the impedance, okay? And that's going to dictate, incidentally, I've said this before, but I haven't said it, I don't think I've said it today, so I'm going to say it. The main utility of this is, you can see that once we know the impedance, we don't have to go back and recalculate the impedance here. Once we know it, we know the impedance, the force is almost always prescribed, that means we can solve for the response. Very easy to do. That's really, I think, the main point of, of the use of impedance. We don't have to go back, and, and we don't want to go back, right? <laughs> it, took, it took some effort here. But we, we don't, there's no need to. We know the, you know, you can see it. We know this, we know that, we can get that. Okay, so suppose you're um, driving this here. You feel a certain impedance, there's a certain response. And then somebody, without, you don't, um, let's say somebody instantaneously replaces it with a dash pot of the same impedance. What's going to happen? You're gonna f are you going to feel any difference? Is the response going to be different here? No, no. The, we get the response from the force and the impedance. The impedance is the same. The response has to be the same. So you, the drive cannot tell any difference between the semi-infinite string and a dash pot if the dash pot has the wave impedance here, the characteristic impedance. Okay. So you say, so what? Well, now we're gonna we're gonna do the follow the instructions here. We're gonna go to the next page, but we have to. I gotta remember to come back and do this. Okay. I have this message, or, or if I don't, if I forget, will you guys remind me? We need to do this so we can do the problem set on Monday. Okay. So okay, I'll do this. All right. So. Is everybody with me on this? There's, you can't, dis the drive can't distinguish. There's going to be, there has to be the same response. 
And again, the reason is the response here is the drive divided by the impedance, and we haven't changed the impedance. So now we go to the interesting case that, this, that I saw in high school, right? Let's put a string in, but this, let's have our string between a finite length between the driven point and the dash pod. Now there's a little bit of a practical consideration here. If you just had this string, which has to be under tension, right? Um, what happens when you have a, what happens when t is equal to zero, when there's no tension? What does our theory say? Well, it gives us no waves. Is that true in, in reality? No, if you take a string with no tension and you, you drive, you're going to get waves. They're, they're inherently nonlinear waves. They're not, we, there's, we can't go to the linear level, linear regime. So we have to have tension in our case. So this, the dash pot's going to be torqued here. So how do you defeat that? Well, the standard way to do is you can have another string here that's much lighter than this string. And you can have it go, um, because this is going to be moving up and down, you want to terminate it sufficiently far here. And because it's much lighter, it'll have the same tension, same tension as, as, as this one. And because it's much lighter, it, it plays... Huh. Now I'm worried about this, but it's going to play, it plays no role, no essential role. See, we've assumed in our theory that you know, we don't have this problem in, 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 in our theory here. We're assuming that this point is just magically, it can go up and down, but it can't go anywhere here, right? But experimentally, we have to implement that, and this is one way of doing it. If, if this didn't have, if this weren't light, then it's going to change, it'll be, it's going to change the impedance. <laughs> that's, that's the way we think about it. It'll change the termination impedance here. So now what's going to happen? I think you know the, the answer. You've seen it. But why? We're not going to get any reflections. How do you explain that? I don't have the, I don't really have the explanation down there, do I? I wrote it in this morning. So why? Why do we get no reflections if the dash pot has this, the same impedance as this string here? Well, you can imagine here, let's go back to what we were just talking about. Instead of this external drive, look at this length of the string here. It, you can imagine it as driving this point here. The string to the left, which, which is to, the string which is to the left, is, is driving this point here. If the string continued on here, let's say we had no dash pot and the string just continued here. We're back to our situation here, but instead of this external force, we have the string driving this point. So I can think of the string here, when I have a full string here, I can think of the string, this part, as driving the rest of the string here. Now, if I go in, it sees a certain impedance. If I go in and replace it with this, it sees the same impedance. So the system will respond the same. If I take this out and have an infant string here, it's going to ro res respond the same. It has to respond the same. Because we get the same, we're going to get the same displacement here. This, this string can't, again, it can't tell, like, like the force here, it can't tell any difference between the situation of an infinite string here and one where we, it's terminated and we have this dash pot here. When the resistance of the dash pot is equal to the wave the wave impedance. So, once you recognize that, we know that when there's a full string here, it does, there's no reflections, of course, right? When you just have a string, and any an infinite string here, we only get right traveling waves. So, um, that is an explanation for how if you, and everyone uses the same phrase here, match the impedance. Have you heard that expression before? Anybody? I'm sure, some, I'm sure some of you have heard that expression. This not only happens you know, in acoustics here, it can happen in electrical circuits when you don't want reflections, you need to match the impedance. So when the impedance is matched here, we're not going to get any reflected waves. 
So let's go over this. I want to demonstrate what we did yesterday and then go a few steps further here. Here's the dash plot. Remember what I showed you yesterday was that it has this property approximately so that when I have a, a pulse coming in here, a wave, it's, it's a little bit of a reflection, right? And of course it doesn't matter whether it's upright or inverted. Um, so, do you think the impedance, how, how, how could I match the impedance? How can we match the impedance here? It, that would seem hard, right? We'd have to d calculate the resistance, this flow resistance. Now it's actually easy, so experimentally, empirically. So let me explain that. Suppose this attachment here were very near the um, axis, our, our, our torsional wire here. Suppose the attachment point were very close. What's going to be the resistance? Very little, right? Because what's important with the, mach with the apparatuses here is the torque. It's, it's the torque that's important here. So when it's here, it's not, well, and I, I don't even have to bring up torque for when it's over here. It's going to have very little motion. So very little resistance. On the other hand, what happens when I put it way over? Oh, so let's verify that. Now, of course, this is not German. <laughs> this is Pasco, the American company. And I can't really do this, <laughs> OK? Um, so we have to do the best we can here. I've got space problems here. But maybe we shouldn't be doing this. That's really bent severely. But did you see, what's, what's the nature of the pulse here? If a pulse comes in this way, the reflected pulse is it is, well, I had still had waves on it. It's upright. So this is effectively what kind of an end? Free, Free end. end. Yeah. yeah. We're getting a little bit of dissipation. So I think this is obvious. If we made the connection closer and closer to the axis, the resistance is going to go to zero. And it's going to act like a free end. And the, in that case, as we saw yesterday, the, the pulse, the reflected pulse is, is upright. It's not inverted. Now, what about if we go here? We can. This is not a problem. What if I go out to the end here? Well, this is distinguished from the original case here. There's, there's going to be now more, more torque, right? So what do we expect is going to happen? What would you guess if you had to guess? It's going to behave more like a fixed end. So when the pulse comes here, it should get inverted and see it? <coughs> yeah, it's inverted. And similarly, if, if it came in the other way, like this, it should come out. Yeah, right. So it's natural to think that somewhere in between what's going to happen. If it's down here, the pulse uh, comes back this way. If it's out here, it comes somewhere in between. What do you think is going to happen? It's going to get swallowed up. That's what I used to think. Yeah, no reflection. I don't think that's true. I don't think we're guaranteed that. Because there's, uh, there could be some phasing, something could be going on here. I don't think we're guaranteed. I think it's just plausible that somewhere in between. You know, down here, the wave comes in, it comes at back non-inverted. Here it's inverted. So somewhere in between, it's plausible. But I, I don't think it's absolutely necessary. However, we know that it's true, don't we? Because it must be this case right here. That's, um, it does exist, okay? Now, I, you know, I don't know if we could confirm this experimentally. Um, it involves some fluid dynamics here, right? But it's just got to be the case that the resistance in this case, when it's, when it's right here at this critical point, the resistance is equal to rho C. Now you'll notice, I want to make one more s statement about this. So um, you might think, and I've done this, I've tried this, you might think that if you just very carefully adjust this point here that you should get no reflected wave. It's not going to happen. 
I tried. So what, what do you think is going on there? You'd think that we could cut down on the reflected wave as much as possible just by carefully finding that critical point there. But it doesn't happen. You're always going to get some reflected wave in this system. So what do you think is going on? Can't match the impedance. Hmm? Can't match the impedance. Well, yeah, but that's just sort of restating why. So, what'd you say, James? Yeah. <coughs> you get a different resistance in the dash pod pulling it up through liquid versus pushing it down from compressor. Oh, um, okay. You're talking about there's some asymmetry in the dash pod here. That's actually getting, that's getting to the point. That's getting there. Yeah. It's the same with electric uh, circuits. Because of my English, I'll uh, show you something here. When it's the not the same as electrical circuits. Uh, I'll tell you right now. Translating uh, that the max power transfer in the dash. No, 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 I'll tell you right now. That's not. I don't think that's the answer here. And I'll tell you. I'll tell you why. Okay. Because you're probably talking about linear electrical circuits. Yes. Right. I think it's nonlinearity. When this, you see the. Can everybody see the dash pot? You know the disc there and it's going like this. Do you think that's laminar flow, nice smooth flow with no turbulence? No way. You know this is going to be turbulent. This cannot be linear. The resistive force cannot be exactly proportional to the velocity. So it's got to be nonlinear. That's what I think is going on. But you know, there could be something else. But I, I, I would put my money on that. If I, I don't bet, but if I did. <laughs> Okay, so sorry to cut you off, but uh, Evangelos, but Evangelos, I think it's yeah. however you, whatever you call it. This because of the two resistance maths. Yeah, so the max power transfer is when the resistance. Maths. Yeah, when you've matched the impedance, right? This comes up in electrical circuits, and you, and that can be done very accurately. Here we see that it, it, you can't match it. You can't match it. And I think it's because this is not exactly a linear element. In electrical circuits, those typically linear elements are highly linear. But this is a mechanical system. And our whole theory here assumes a resistive force proportional to the velocity. And that's just not going to, if you've had any fluid mechanics, you just know it's, the Reynolds number is not small here. If you've had any fluid mechanics, a dimensionless number. It's, just, it's not going to be linear damping. It's just a rough approximation here. Okay. Um, so now, oh, now we have, to, any, any more questions or comments about that? Yeah, this is an important, this matching impedance is, is a big deal. That's why they have a name for it, matching impedance. And it comes up in a lot of situations. Okay. Oh. Somebody took my note. We got to go back, yeah. I had a note to remind me, the note's gone, but we remember something. Okay, so there's one more thing we want to do here, and that's energy, or power in this case. So the instantaneous power delivered by the drive powers force times velocity. And remember, you've got to take the real parts, well, to be, there's that trick. Remember that came up in a homework problem? When you're dealing with complex numbers, you take the, com I don't know if you guys remember that, but we, we should stay away from that. In fact. So, you, so you're probably wondering, why did I assign the problem? I don't know. <laughs> but it is useful. But here, let's be really careful, OK? We have to take the real part first, because the operations don't commute. If you just shoved in the complex force, the complex velocity, and then takes real, real part, you're not going to get the same answer. So here's the real part of the force. Here's the real part of the velocity. Nice and simple. You see the impedance there, OK? Um, Oh, okay. So I should have said this because I've talked about it before, but then we finally got to the end here. The force and the velocity are in phase here. See that? Do you see any eyes here? No, the force and the velocity, or any minus signs? They're not 180 degrees out, they're, in, they're right in phase. So that's going to give us maximal power input. Force times velocity here. 
We almost always, this is the instantaneous value, we almost, we almost always average it. The average of a cosine squared is one half, as we've seen a number of times. And this is the expression we end up for the average power that's being put in by the drive, in the steady state. This is all assuming steady state here, our solution, steady state. And you don't have to remember this, why? So if you think of a resistor, with a voltage across it. The power is I squared, I squared R, but because we're using peak amplitudes, it's going to be one half I squared R. And another way to write that using Ohm's law is V squared over R. Here's our R. So you don't have to, you don't have to remember this. You just have to, you know, you just use the, uh, think of it as a resistor, the electrical equivalent. Um, so that's the average power input. The, the velocity amplitude. Uh, another way we can look at this is um, the velocity amplitude at x equals zero from the impedance approach is just equal to this, right? This is impedance is equal to complex drive or complex response. I've taken the absolute value. So here's the relationship, here's the velocity. We can also equivalently write this like this, and now it looks even better, doesn't it? Although, maybe I should have put the rho c on the other side, because then we get one half i squared r, and everybody remembers that. I squared r, it's even, they're even called i squared r losses, the power being dissipated in, in a resistor. Okay, anybody have any questions? Or any problems? connected with this class. Uh, okay, so we're ending a little early today. I want you, I want you to notice that because sometimes we go over. I just want to point that out. <laughs>